Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Keeping Up with Azure AD Connect. I'm McKenna. I work alongside the tech experts here at Chaosoft. Just a couple housekeeping items to go over before we jump into the presentation. First off, you'll notice that your microphones are muted to make sure that everybody has an optimal listening experience. But we do encourage you to ask any questions you may have. So depending on how you join today, either in browser or through the app, you'll see a question or chat section on your screen. Feel free to drop your questions there and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, if we do run short on time today for questions, we'll reach out to you um, individually uh, to answer those questions that you have. At the end of the presentation, we'll also be doing a drawing for two Amazon gift cards, both $50. So make sure that you stay on till the very end uh, for your chance to win. This session will also be recorded and we'll email you a link in the days following to share with your team. So for today, webinar will be talking about all things Azure AD Connect. We have two Microsoft identity experts here today to share their insights and it's going to be a great presentation. Uh, first of which is Robert Bobel, uh, the founder and CEO of Chaosoft. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Bob. Hey, thanks, McKenna. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. I'm Bob Bobel. Uh, I am one of the founders and uh, CEO of a company called Chaosoft, which you may or may not be familiar with. And um, as we were uh, in our discussions about what we wanted to to talk about uh, in our next webinar, this is several months ago, I started realizing there was just a general lack of attention being paid to probably the the biggest unsung hero in the Microsoft uh, Microsoft move to cloud story, and that's Azure AD Connect. And as soon as I thought about synchronization and identity management, and that led me to, to uh, thinking about things that Microsoft's been working on for quite some time. I immediately thought uh, of uh, Oxford Computer Group. They're probably the foremost expert on Microsoft uh, and uh, the history and, and path that has led to uh, Azure AD Connect. And so we're very fortunate to, uh, to have uh, a very, um, I think senior member of that, and I mean senior in terms of, of stature, not in, in terms of age, uh, joining us. And I'll introduce uh, that gentleman here in just a moment. Uh, but, but part of what we wanted to also discuss is, is not just Azure AD Connect, but how it fits into a broader picture of what's going on with hybrid. Um, and so part of our research here at Chaosoft was to understand you know, how our products fit into that that world and we had needed to understand the world better. So we contracted a research group called Pulse Research um, here in, in 2021 and they did some research for us to just kind of dig into where people were in the hybrid story or in the hybrid process. And so you know, we see this as kind of a three stage process for a lot of organizations. They start out on premise and have been forever. Um, and then they start to embrace uh, Microsoft's cloud offerings. Oftentimes it's the mailboxes that get moved first, right? That's maybe one of the first things. Get rid of that exchange thing, put it out there, let them deal with the servers, but we still need the services uh, provided by that for email. Then maybe, or, or maybe it's SharePoint, could be one of those or, or other things. Uh, but that, that second step in the journey is, is that true hybrid where you, you're living in both environments and it's disconnected and it's you know, hard to keep things uh, accurate between, from an administration standpoint, I should say. Um, and that's where Azure AD Connect obviously makes that bridge or, or provides that bridge to, uh, to provide that area. And then a lot of organizations are moving on beyond that and looking for the future. And a lot of smaller organizations are already there. So we uh, took a picture uh, through, through Pulse Research of sort of what was going on at, uh, at the current moment. Um, and you know, the first thing that was very surprising is that with this transition to cloud, there were folks that were saying, hey, you know, we've had enough of Microsoft, we're gonna move on. But it's a very, very small amount. It was 2%. Uh, and th with those folks, it's likely that they were going to Google um, for their office type uh, applications or, or they were moving to uh, AWS or something like that. 
but but that did register, which I was a little bit surprised. I didn't think people were sort of looking at this as an alternative. Apparently, a very small uh, small number of people were, but the majority were sticking with Microsoft. And and as they moved to the cloud, um, I suspect that those two percent were much smaller organizations. Um, a lot of folks are looking at going cloud only. It's about three to five percent. Uh, sorry, about seven percent over the next three to five years. Again, I, my belief is that most of those were, were midsize or SMB. Um, and again, cloud only, I think uh, those, those are probably smaller folks. While we do hear about enterprises, most of our customers are fairly large and, and we just don't see a lot of really large enterprise customers moving uh, that way. Even though these were mostly supposed to be enterprise, I think we got some that were maybe midsize or small midsize. Um, already cloud only 17%. That was a big shock um, that uh, that many folks have, have gone cloud only for the type of environments we were talking about. Um, and then this we do hear about. We think uh, we, we're hearing more and more enterprises talking about moving cloud only. Um, so that registered in at 18%. But again, those were not the really large enterprises. These are, are maybe you know 3,000 employees and maybe up to 5,000. We, we hear that consistently. Um, I don't think it'll be one to two years. There's just too much legacy there. And then, um, you know, 2% are planning to remain on premise, but the, the vast majority, 54%, were going to stay hybrid for the foreseeable future, meaning no, no shift. Now, this is in contrast to another survey, uh, a little less formal survey that we had done. Uh, but if you add all these pieces up, it's roughly 70% of, the, of, of enterprises and mid market customers are hybrid today. And uh, even though they have plans to, you know, to look at going cloud only, and, and they say they're they're going cloud only, it's it, it the reality is it's going to take them a lot longer. So hybrid is definitely the standard currently. AD uh, in the cloud, Azure AD doesn't quite have everything that Azure, uh, sorry, that uh, Legacy Active Directory on premise directory does. Um, transitioning to cloud only can be complex. There's new authentication mechanisms and all sorts of cool stuff that you get to play with. But that takes time to learn and to and to deploy properly. Um, and you know the hybrid environments um, can still have cloud only objects, right? If you're using Microsoft Teams, perfect example, you may be fully hybrid. Your user accounts, the keys to the kingdom may still be on premise, but you have Office three sixty five groups which are driving teams. all that's in the cloud. so. So with that said, it gives you a pretty good picture that hybrid is here for quite some time. And I believe that uh, 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 for the foreseeable future, there will be uh, this need to have this select and very, um, I think, focused solution for getting your, your identities and your group uh, memberships from on-premise to cloud and eventually other things. So with that, I don't want to delay any longer. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Hugh Simpson-Wells. Uh, Hugh is uh, been at uh, identity conferences, I think, that I've been attending uh, best part of the last 20 years. And it's always a treat to uh, uh, to um, hear Hugh speak. Hugh, can you hear me? I can hear you. It's amazing that those cables across the oceans, or oh, are they satellites now, still work. Hugh is in England. Uh, I'm in Ohio in the United States, so we're... we're um, by, comp uh, by country this year. With that said, uh, Hugh, why don't you give us a little bit of your background before we jump into this? Uh, how did you get started with Oxford, I guess, is the first big question. Well, <clears throat> I, I suppose what I'd say is there were uh, microchip and microprocessor had come out, the first computers had come out, it seemed like an exciting thing to get into. And I just gradually got into it. Um, there was no big decision, I don't think, at any point, but uh, it's been a fun ride. Excellent. So with uh, that, and as for your comment, as for your comment about uh, senior, I think I have to take senior in all its meanings uh, nowadays. So, <laughs> no, no well, I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. So. So with this, I'm going to switch it over to Hugh, and we'll let him take over the presentation. Sure. Let's get straight on with this. Um, so uh, let's start with something very simple. Um, let's talk about exactly what Azure AD Connect is. So we've 
typically got this on-premises Active Directory estate uh, represented on the left here, one or more forests, and we've typically got a tenant in Microsoft Azure Active Directory. What we're trying to show there is that you don't own it like you own your servers and so on, you are just a tenant in there. And over on the right are some of the applications that you might be trying to use. And what Azure AD Connect is, is, is the glue that sticks all of this together. Um, Bob mentioned it being the unsung hero, very much so. And I think part of that is that uh, it's free and you know you don't get anything good for free, right? Um, part of it, I think, is that you do an express install and there it is and it runs and you never have to think about it again. Um, I want to say a little bit about that as we go along because I think you can get more out of it if you uh, don't treat it in quite that way. Now, if we dig into that a little, um, Azure AD Connect is not just one thing, it's actually a number of components. Uh, first of all, it is a sync engine. That's, the, that's what we really think of when we talk about Azure AD Connect. We think of synchronization, we think of it reading objects, users and groups and computers and what have you, out of on-premises AD and provisioning them, synchronizing them with the cloud, provisioning them into the cloud, into Azure AD. Um, the way it does that will depend on the particular scenario, and I'll be talking about some of the scenarios and the different ways that objects might be might be treated. And there are some right back scenarios. There are situations where it happens the other way around, where objects from the cloud are synchronized back to on premises. But there are some other components. First of all, there is support for federation, and in fact, ADFS is considered really to be part of the Azure AD Connect package. Now, I won't be talking about federation, and there's a reason for that that I'll come to, uh, but I won't be talking about federation very much, but I will name check it from time to time because it is part of the package. Then there's a thin client, an on-premises client, uh, in addition to the synchronization, which is also an on-premises uh, server service. Uh, that client supports various uh, scenarios and features. So it supports password hash synchronization, which I'll be talking about quite a lot, password write back and pass through authentication, amongst other things. Then there is a Jody Connect Health, which is an additional set of services, which as you'd expect is checking the health of Azure AD Connect and surfacing alerts and reports in the cloud in Azure AD Connect where, where we'd like to see them. And as for the aims of Azure AD Connect, well, first of all, from an administrative point of view, it's nice to be able to manage identities in one place rather than having to manage them in two places, two, maybe we could even say two or more places, but two places. And the other thing is from a user point of view, users want to be able to sign in from wherever, on whatever, whether they're inside or outside the corporate network, and they really don't want to be remembering two sets of credentials, and, and indeed, they'd really rather just have to sign in once whenever possible. And they shouldn't have to worry about what's going on under the covers, where things are, uh, where authentication is actually happening. So I think that, that that's the overall picture. I want to just name check, and I'm only going to do this probably once in the entire thing, uh, Microsoft's synchronization engines in general. There is this thing called a Microsoft Identity Manager, which has been around under a lot of names for a long time. The reason for mentioning it is that there have been a number of spin-off uh, synchronization engines that do the job that we're talking about. The first was DirSync. Part of the reason for putting up this slide is to just make sure that we're not confusing DirSync with anything else, because quite, on, uh, quite often I've heard people refer to Azure AD Connect as DirSync. That's a different thing. It was the first attempt. It came out of, it grew out of uh, early versions of uh, Microsoft Identity Manager when it was called Identity Lifecycle Manager and Forefront Identity Manager. Only dealt with single forests, and it really didn't support anything except the most simple synchronization. Uh, a stopgap to cover multi-forest was the Azure connector, the Azure AD connector that was available with um, what is now Microsoft Identity Manager. That uh, should no longer be used. Uh, it is not supported by Microsoft to use Microsoft Identity Manager to do the job, job that Azure AD Connect is doing. There's a good reason for that, and it has to do with the continual improvements that are going on and not wanting to have to support two different things because Azure AD Connect is very much a live animal that's, that's changing and, and doing new things. 
Then we had yet another iteration of this, which was called Azure AD Sync. Again, that's come to end of life, but that's where the where, where we really saw Azure AD Connect starting to look the way it was going to look with what's called de declarative provisioning, which I don't want to make uh, too much of, but it just let's just say it didn't involve code. And now we have two current versions of Azure AD Connect. There's what's now being called classic. I don't think that's a, a proper brand, but I think the, the reason for it is to distinguish it from the other one, which is called Cloud Sync. So I, I'm going to be focusing on Azure AD Classic for the very good reason that Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync only covers a small subset of what Azure AD Connect uh, Classic can do. Um, Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync, yes, it's cloud-based, very easily configured. Uh, it's okay for simple cases. We're talking single forest. I'll, I'll make a bit more of that in, in just a moment. Um, it does do one special thing that, it, that the classic version doesn't do, and that's to handle multiple disconnected forests. That's where you've got forests that can't see each other on the corporate network. And you can imagine that happening after a merge of two organizations or whatever. Um, so these are the two current versions, and both can synchronize users along with their password hashes. I'll be making a lot more of this as we go along, uh, and groups. Cloud Sync then does this one thing that Classic can't do, which is multiple disconnected forests. But Classic does a lot of things that Cloud Sync can't do, and this is just some of the things, which is including devices as well as users and groups, handling multi-forest situations uh, where uh, a user uh, or even a group might be represented in more than one of those forests, and we want to consolidate those. I'll be saying more about that shortly. Um, authentication options, because Azure AD Connect very importantly supports authentication. Uh, I'll be saying more about that as we go along. Uh, any kind of advanced customization, um, things like uh, editing the, the rules that control the way that objects are provisioned, synchronized then, and joined together and so on, and any write back options. So you can see that there are very few reasons really to be using the Cloud Sync version at the moment. What we might do is say, we can see that that's a step towards some other way. We can see that that is a step towards a solution which gets us away from on-premises. As yet, uh, it doesn't really matter because we're hybrid anyway. Uh, Azure AD Connect Classic is very much still an on-premises uh, server. Uh, let's talk now about the way that many, many organizations get into using, and I'm only going to be talking now about the classic version from now on, uh, about using Azure AD Connect. Um, they're going to do express installation. Very easy, very straightforward thing to do, and straight away, in a very short time, you're synchronizing your users and groups, with the exception of some special, special accounts, uh, but basically all users and groups across all the OUs that we can see uh, from only, uh, only from a single forest in the Express installation case. That includes password hash synchronization, about which more later. You can always run the wizard again to make uh, changes. A fairly obvious example of a change you want to make is to restrict the OUs to be included so that you, you haven't got a lot of users and groups that you don't care about being replicated in the cloud. But uh, here's really the first thing I, I want to, to say in the way of, of tips. Um, always, of course, check out the prerequisite as you would for any server before you install it. That's, that's, that's a given, I think. But think about your domain names, your users on premise, uh, your, the domain names you might be using in AD might not be uh, internet domains. In other words, uh, uh, proper domains that are available within the internet, um, you probably want your users to be able to use the same user principal name on premise in the cloud. So get that organized, buy the domain you need, then ensure that AD matches up with that. And that might mean going through a change, an on premises change that you need to go through before uh, installing. But the last thing, and although it's the last thing and the smallest thing perhaps on this slide, the most important thing is clean up your data. It doesn't make sense when you're doing any synchronization job to simply synchronize bad data so that you end up with more bad data at the other end. So this means taking the trouble to do some sanitization of your usernames, 
your UPNs, getting rid of accounts that are, are not being used, that sort of thing. Um, and there is an ID fix uh, tool, which I've mentioned there, which will help with this. All it really does is look for illegal names and so on. So it, it only does part of the job. You've still got to eyeball it. You've still got to be on top of it. You've still got to try and clean up all those unused accounts that are hanging around. There is a custom installation. So through the wizard, you can do this express installation, which I've just mentioned. More or less all users uh, and groups being synchronized, password hash synchronization included, and you can run the wizard to customize it afterwards. Of course, what you could have done is done a custom installation from the, from the start and not run the wizard afterwards. But that would then mean you could do all sorts of other things, multi-forest, choice of authentication options, and all sorts of other options, such as write-back options. Then there is the beyond the wizard approach, where you make changes to the rules that are governing the synchronization. Now, the wizard does a very, very good job of writing out the correct rules to go with all the choices you've made in the uh, in the wizard. But uh, you can go in and edit those with care. I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. So I've mentioned several times the idea of user synchronization and other things being synchronized. Let's be clear about what we're talking about. We may have a user that's represented in more than one forest. This happens because it's the account resource kind of scenario where you've got an account forest and maybe an exchange forest, or it could be that you've got two forests, perhaps from two different organizations that have merged, and you've represented through some process that might be called a gal sync process, a global address list synchronization, which has made sure that each user in each forest is represented in the other forest um, as a contact. Or it could be some other way in which a user is represented more than once. Now, it's one thing to say that we want that user to be provisioned into AD. By the way, the reason it's to stage is because Azure AD Connect is a meta directory. What it does is it keeps a copy of everything, actually more than one copy, but let's not go there for the moment. And we provision, first of all, into Azure AD Connect and then out to AD. We may want attributes, that is, some of the information that we keep about an object from Forest B. It might be that there's an email address or a name or something that we'd like to include. So what we want to do is somehow let that join in. And this is what one of the things that Azure AD Connect is very good at, identifying that this is actually the same user. Obviously, there has to be a way that that happens. I'll come back to that. And uh, consolidating that user so that we end up with a single representation in the cloud. Once that's been done, we have pipe work in place for attributes to flow. Most of those attributes flow from left to right, from on-premises to the cloud, but they can flow the other way. Uh, there are a few that flow that way anyway, like GUIDs and things, but you nothing to stop you adding your own attribute flows if there's something of value in the cloud. Let's now talk about group synchronization. First of all, group synchronization that the wizard would typically do. So if you've got a user that's represented uh, in Forest A, uh, we've already seen that, we might have some process creating contacts in Forest B, and we'd like that to join up. And we'd have perhaps uh, got a trust in place where um, Forest C trusts uh, Forest B, and you want to give access to some resources in Forest C uh, using a foreign security principle. I'm just making the point that it can be various ways in which these uh, that this one user can be represented, and we've already seen how that's consolidated. But we're going to have groups as well, and we want those groups to synchronize, of course, and we'll have groups in all the forests. And so what you see uh, happening is the, the aim here is to ensure that that consolidated user is a member of all the groups that they should be a member of from all the forests. And that's, that's a, a absolutely out-of-the-box, uh, classic, out-of-the-box, wizard-driven way of doing things. Here's another approach that might be interesting. Uh, maybe we've got a user uh, and another user. And these are different users from the different forests, but we have a group that we recognize as being sort of the same group. I mean, of course, they're different groups because they're in a different forest, but they're the same group, perhaps with the same name, doing the same sort of job in the different forests. Well, wouldn't it be interesting to find a way in which you could join those up 
and merge the memberships so that you end up with something that looks like this. Uh, that can be done quite easily, but it does involve customizing rules. So it's, it's the sort of thing that would go into that other area beyond uh, the wizard where you modify uh, rules to make more interesting things happen. And I keep mentioning rules, so let's say a little bit more about what these rules are. These are the rules which uh, control the way that the data is handled, the way that it flows, the synchronization. Uh, a very, very simple case, and there are lots and lots of these, is a transformation where you're simply saying flow data from uh, a particular named attribute in on-premise to a particular named attribute eventually in uh, Azure AD. Now, they may well be the same. I've got given name to given name, surname to surname. They could be quite different. Uh, and it could be that the transformation is taking place. For, for example, perhaps the surname is supposed to go to uppercase, as we've got here. And you can also see that there can be multiple rules handling the same data essentially flowing into the same attribute so we end up with precedence between them and this is the kind of thing that the uh, wizard takes care of for us but that we can uh, modify uh, rules also handle the way that joins and projections happen in other words the flow of the object as well as the attributes now, i'm not going to go into any great detail about this i'm simply going to say that these can be modified with care and that care extends to making sure that when an upgrade happens to Azure AD, something else I'll be talking about later, uh, that you don't simply overwrite all the changes that you've made. And the way that's usually handled is by just adding a rule of your own with a, a different level of precedence, a more powerful precedence. It's a bit more complicated than that, but it's the general idea. So we have these rules that, that could be modified. Now, I talked about this concept of joining and the question arises, how can that join take place? What is it that allows the wizard, uh, having, or the, I'd say the rules which have been written by the wizard, to identify that this is the same person in these different forests, two representations of the same identity, I suppose we would say. Well, uh, we it could be that they've got the same email address. It could be they've got the same account name. It could be they've got the same employee ID. Depending on your overall scenario, some of those things could be true. And so within the wizard, you can make a choice that either users are represented only once across all directories. Now, that's a somewhat trivial uh, case where these two are not nothing to do with each other. They're entirely separate and you'll end up with two different uh, users in Azure AD. The other possibility is that there is a way of matching them. And you'll see that you've got quite a few choices. Mail, uh, SID, that would be the uh, the case where you've got exchange, SAM account name, mail nickname, or something that you specify yourself, such as employee ID. So very, very flexible, and the wizard will write out the appropriate rules so that that works in each case. I've mentioned users and groups, but not devices yet. This is a very important type of synchronization. Uh, if you configure this, and that won't be configured as an express installation, that is something that you'll have to actually choose, any domain joined computers can become Azure AD joined devices. And this is you'll see this is much simpler. There's no question of merging or anything clever like that. It's a very, very straightforward type of synchronization. And the, the beauty of this is that uh, if AD trusts this uh, trusts this uh, domain joined computer, so will Azure AD trust this device. And the result is that a user can often get a very straightforward single sign-on purely on the base of the uh, basis of the trust in that device. And that is the nicest form of single sign-in sign-on that we can we can get. Now, there is an alternative to this, um, which is uh, device write back. I'm not going to make too much of it. It only deals with uh, a few, I would call edge cases to do with Windows Hello and conditional access in ADFS. But uh, it is an alternative. You can't have both. Uh, and many, many organizations will, will be using hybrid as your AD join. Let's now talk a little bit about uh, overall scenarios. Having we, We've been actually in the weeds a little bit with uh, different kinds of synchronization. Um, first of all, pretty obvious, we've dealt with it very easily, is single tenant, single forest, single Azure AD Connect. Note that this lower 
uh, configuration is simply not allowed. You cannot have more than one Azure AD Connect writing into any tenant, any individual Azure AD tenant. When you've got multiple forests, Azure AD Connect will handle those multiple forests. It does it very nicely, uh, very cleverly, in fact, and, and again, very much wizard driven. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing terrible you have to do. What you can't do is try and configure it like, like the lower of these figures here. Again, only one Azure AD Connect instance per tenant. If you have multiple tenants, well, you can do one of these things. The top one's trivial because it's really just two single instances, whereas the lower one, we're simply showing that in principle, you could be drawing from different domains or forests within your AD estate. But uh, again, one is already connect per one uh, tenant. So I think that's all pretty, pretty straightforward at the, at the high level. Let's move on to the authentication options. I've already mentioned Azure AD Hybrid Join, which is perhaps, uh, you know, one of the, uh, uh, again, I'd call that almost the unsung one because it's, it's not in your face. When you make your authentication uh, options uh, choices, it tends to put in front of you password, hash synchronization, pass through authentication. But Azure AD Hybrid Join gives this opportunity to authenticate very much at a device level, which is a nice way of doing it. Then, we see what are called the managed authentication methods, and that's to distinguish it really from the federated ones. So the two managed ones are password hash synchronization, which I've talked about quite a lot, where the, as well as a user's uh, username, account name, UPN being synchronized, their password hash is synchronized. Now it's not really the password hash that's synchronized, it is a hash of the hash. But what happens is that that password hash, which uh, you will never, AD doesn't even know your password, it only knows as a hash of your password. It hashes the, uh, your password each time you enter it, compares it with the hash that it's stored, and if they match, well, you can get authenticated. Same sort of thing goes on in the cloud, except it's a hash of the hash. So it goes through quite a complicated hashing routine in the cloud every time you authenticate. Password hash synchronization then leads to what is often referred to as same sign-on, which is a little bit of an abuse of SSO, but uh, SSO tends to, to get that, unfortunately. So same sign-on means you use the same username, same password when you hit the on-premises, when you hit the cloud. Pass-through authentication is rather different. Pass-through authentication always authenticates against the on-premises AD. So even when you hit the cloud, it's, it's AD that's doing the authentication. A little bit more about that in a moment and how that works, but it involves an on-premises agent to do it, all very straightforward, all wizard-driven. So that's two fundamental alternatives for managed authentication methods. On top of that, in addition to it, you can switch on seamless SSO. So this is Microsoft's way of distinguishing between SSO, which could mean same sign-on and single sign-on, so seamless single sign-on, real single sign-on, they would say. Uh, this configures Azure AD as a Kerberos service so that any user that has an Active Directory sign-in, has a Kerberos ticket, will get a true sign-on in Azure AD. It's opportunistic. So it is an addition to one of the other ways of doing it. And it will fall back on one of those ways if for whatever reason it doesn't work. Then there's support for federated authentication. Now, I'm not gonna say too much about it because I feel that the federation options were included because when Azure AD Connect first came out, there wasn't a pass-through authentication. I think once PTA came along, there was a lot less uh, to uh, reason to go with federate, federated authentication because it typically involves so much more infrastructure. And so for that reason, I think I'm just gonna play it down and say it's still there, but we're not gonna use it. I'm not gonna talk about it, I mean. Um, so password hash synchronization, as well as the normal synchronization process going on that's synchronizing attributes such as UPN, whether the, whether the account's enabled and so on, happening on a typically on a 30 minute cycle, password hash synchronization is something that happens much, much more quickly, much more often, so that we've uh, almost always got the same hash available uh, in the cloud and on premises. Pass through authentication, a little different when, sorry, what I should have said is when a user signs in in either end, they have a similar experience. 
with pass-through authentication, the user can still sign in uh, through Active Directory on-premises, but when they hit the cloud, uh, that username and encrypted password uh, is uh, sent to the authenticator, authentication agent on-premise, which validates them and so on. Now, it doesn't really work exactly like I'm showing you, but at a high level, it's a reasonable way to put it. In fact, there's no inbound uh, connection at all. The authentication uh, agent reaches out uh, to get the latest uh, request from a queue. So uh, we shouldn't be worried from a security, that security uh, perspective. The response is then uh, sent back to the um, STS in Azure AD and the response finds its way to the user. So the user uh, experience um, is, is still a good one, uh, although they're still at this stage got two different sign-ins for on-premise in the cloud, but note that it's now Active Directory, and therefore you've got all of the possibilities, the additional possibilities with an Active Directory, such as uh, being able to block people out at different times of the day and so on. You've got a little bit more control over the authentication uh, uh, activity of that person. So here is a, 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 a bit of a summary for the different sorts of authentication, which I think is worth putting up because uh, there's quite a lot going on here. Uh, your first decision is basically which authentication method do you want to use? Um, password hash synchronization is simple, very low footprint, Microsoft recommended, it's the express installation. You would use password authentication when you want to enforce local AD user level policies because AD is a somewhat more sophisticated directory from that perspective. Um, in the case of ADFS, there are a few edge cases left which I've listed there, where you would need perhaps to use a federated approach, or it may just be that you want to use some third party approach, the support is there. Um, what gets installed? Very little for PHS, a client, a password authentication client in the case of PTA, and generally speaking, wizard driven, uh, generally speaking, you'd uh, deploy a few of them for high availability. One interesting thing about uh, ADFS and Azure AD Connect is that um, it will, uh, Azure AD Connect, the wizard, will actually deploy your uh, ADFS infrastructure if, if you're interested in that, which is pretty clever. But as I say, I think it's not as important as it was. Next, if you want seamless proper single sign-on, you can check the box, that's all it really is in the wizard, for seamless single sign-on, which will work with either PHS or PTA, as I say, on an opportunistic basis. It's assumed that within your federation, that's the whole point, there'll be single sign-on anyway. Another thing you can do, and should do perhaps, is install PHS anyway. So even after you've chosen pass-through authentication as your authentication method, you can install PHS additionally. So the hashes are being synchronized to the cloud even though you're not using them. Now, why? A couple of reasons. First and most important is that you're going to benefit from a lot of the security work that Microsoft are doing. They're going out and buying um, blacklists, uh, black market lists of uh, usernames and passwords and they're checking the password hashes against the ones they store. In other words, they are looking to see if your um, credentials are available out on the internet. And if you don't synchronize your AD to Azure AD hashes, that can't happen. So in other words, you, you, you can get warned about problems you have in AD as a, uh, because of the work they're doing in Azure AD. So uh, it's again recommended to, to do that always. Another reason for doing it is that if you ever had to switch off password authentication and revert to password hash synchronization, perhaps you've had a you know, failure of, a, of some servers or something like that, um, well, the passwords are already synchronized and so uh, it, it would be a quicker process. This should almost be the first thing in this list, but as, as I've said before, additionally, there is this hybrid Azure AD join, which can give you uh, perhaps the best uh, user experience, um, but these other ones have to be there as well. Something else has to be there. Okay, so that's uh, authentication, I think, covered uh, fairly well. Uh, the next are the write-back options. Now, it's fairly obvious that um, 
what the the attraction would be of users being written back you might want to get to the point where you can manage your users in the cloud and have them written back to uh, the on-premises AD. There are some technical problems with this which have prevented this happening up to now. But my understanding is that it's something that should happen in the future. At the moment, there are no user write-back options. It is we only write forward into the cloud. Groups, however, can be written back. And this would be where Exchange is present in order that you can create distribution groups that match up with your various uh, Azure AD or Office 365 groups. Got a bracket in the wrong place there, sorry. So uh, your Azure AD groups, be them security groups or Office 365 groups, whatever, um, can be written back as on-premises distribution groups. Uh, not as yet as, as security groups, but we could also imagine that happening, um, tying in perhaps with users uh, being written back. Uh, device write back I've mentioned I don't think it's uh, very important or exciting so I won't say anything else about it but password write back is very important because of course many organizations are using Azure AD to provide self-service password reset for their users now they're almost certainly in the hybrid world going to want those writing back to AD so let's talk a little bit more about that passwords then can be written back to AD, and then they can also be written to Azure AD if PHS is in use. I use the term password very loosely because we never write a password. It's always the hash or the hash of the hash, but I think by now you get my meaning. So password or part of their hashes are written back to AD and also to Azure AD if through the password hash synchronization. Now, it may seem rather odd that you could do a self-service password reset thinking that it was being written to Azure AD, but it's actually taking a round trip where it first of all gets written down to AD and then gets synchronized up to Azure AD. But that is the current model, that's how it, how it works, if you've got password right back in place. Of course, that makes the password subject to AD policy, not to Azure AD policy. Uh, again, no problem with that, it just means you've got to think about uh, where you're, what policies you're defining where. Uh, and if you've got PHS in use, password hash synchronization, of course it will also have to meet the Azure AD uh, policy. Now this works for uh, a password change, a self-service password reset or administrative change. In fact, it works for any kind of change in the cloud. So a user could go into their MyApps portal and change their password. They can do the self-service password reset uh, in the cloud, or an administrator may simply come along and change the user's password. All of those will be written back to AD through password write backs. So it's a really important feature if you're uh, intending to use uh, a hybrid in the way we've been describing. Uh, other things to say about it is, um, of course, you, you, it needs zero delay feedback to the user. The user needs to get the feedback that either the password was successfully written or it didn't meet the AD policy or whatever. They get that, that's fine. It can be enabled with password authentication uh, and password hash synchronization. Like I said, password hash synchronization is normally there anyway. Of course, it will only work with password authentication if uh, the, the accounts are being synchronized. Uh, maybe it's not clear why I said, of course, maybe not. I'll come back to that in just a second uh, because that relates to the final point. Synchronization rules govern the pathway for a password. What I mean there is, if we've got password hashes able to be written up to Azure AD and uh, uh, passwords being possibly written back to uh, Active Directory, there is a question mark over how we know the right path to take. If there's more than one forest, how will Azure AD know which forest to write the password into? And it is the rules that we've mentioned a number of times that define this. There, there is a way of specifying the pathway through the rules, it's basically a series of checkbox on different checkboxes on different rules that basically sort of say this is the rule. Um, and that's uh, why I mentioned that password authentication is only going to work if there is a path for a password to take. So uh, that's uh, the write back options. Let's talk a little bit now about resilience. Um, several things to say here which uh, you know 
cover a lot of ground really one is to consider um, implementing the ad recycle bin uh, it works very well with the azure id recycle bin and uh, let's just consider uh, azure id connect having been implemented let's let's it, it, with any synchronization process how easy it is to get it wrong and delete a lot of things if for example you were deciding uh, on which ous were going to be synchronized and you accidentally uh, don't include a bunch of them that looks like a whole bunch of deletions to azure id connect and you end up with deletions uh, in the uh, cloud as a result fortunately azure ad has its recycle bin and what you'll find is that if you re-include those they'll be included very re-included very quickly they never really got deleted they're around for 30 days and so they're recovered but you can also implement the ad recycle bin and that means that if something gets accidentally deleted on premises it's possible to uh, reinstate it from the ad recycle bin and again it will be picked up after the next synchronization run uh, in, from the azure ad recycle bin the corresponding uh, user will and so they work together very well and it is generally recommended to uh, include it as long as it doesn't interfere with any of your uh, other systems that you've got, uh, which is worth checking. Uh, you can usually rely on automatic upgrade of Azure AD Connect, and it is a good idea to do so. Now, if I go back to, and I said I wouldn't say it again, but here I go, uh, Microsoft Identity Manager is something that you tend not to allow to upgrade. Having got it in place and got it working, you leave it working. Azure AD Connect is a little different. As I've said, it's a live uh, beast. It's, it's going through changes all the time because as things change in the cloud, they have to make sure that they change the synchronization engine to work with those changes. And so uh, it is uh, rational to switch to leave automatic upgrades switched on, which is the default. Now, under some circumstance, auto upgrades not possible. This happened, for example, uh, with a, a recent upgrade, which was significant enough that it couldn't happen in an automatic way. But it could just be that you've taken a series of options and messed around with the system such that it's, it's not happy that it can auto upgrade. And you can check that using the uh, AD Sync Auto Upgrade PowerShell tool. Um, so it, if, if that were the case and if auto upgrade wouldn't work, you'd have to yourself monitor for upgrades and do them manually. Generally speaking, though, you do rely on automatic upgrade. It works very well. Azure AD Connect Health um, is, should be, it will be there out of the box. Uh, you should pay attention to it. It surfaces health information in Azure AD, and you can act on the information that it provides um, in the on-premises uh, system, in the on-premises Azure AD Connect. Uh, one would normally use multiple password authentication agents for high availability. Um, it's, it's absolutely perfectly straightforward. You can, in principle, implement as many as you like. And the last thing to say about resilience is you should implement at least one staging mode Azure AD Connect server. Now, I need to say a little bit more about that. Staging mode, um, there can only be a single active sync server communicating with an Azure AD uh, tenant. And I, I stated that rather boldly before that there could only be one Azure AD Connect per tenant. But actually, you can have as many as you like as long as they're staging servers. Um, what you do in the wizard is you check the box to say enable uh, staging mode. Uh, you then have an entirely independent separate server with a separate database, separate everything, which goes through all the motions of the production server, but doesn't export anything. So it should have an identical configuration and you should make sure that that's the case. Um, and uh, there is a way that you can, uh, if, if, if you want, there is a way that you can export an existing production configuration and then use that when you install your staging server, so the two are functionally identical, uh, or you can simply make sure of it yourself if things are, are more complicated. Um, staging servers perform a number of functions. In my example here, the top at the top, A is your production server, B is your staging server. Remember, it's doing everything that the other server's doing. It's going through the entire process of importing everything and synchronizing everything, but it never writes it out. 
uh, that means that it's an excellent backup. If A fails, you can simply switch B uh, out of staging mode. It'll very quickly synchronize up with the cloud because all the data's in place. It just, just needs to realize that. Um, and so it, it supports backup. It also supports testing. So if you want to make changes, if you're changing some rules, if you're getting beyond the wizard, as I would call it, you can make those changes in B, check that it looks like it's behaving well, check what the output looks like. There's a way you can do that. You can poke around in the system and see what it's doing. Uh, and uh, then make that change to A as necessary, or possibly do a swing migration where you start using B and make A your, uh, your staging server. And that's perhaps what you would do if you ever had to do a manual upgrade. It would make sense to do the upgrade on your, uh, on your staging server and then switch over afterwards, and that's the situation in the, in the lower of those two. So a few um, parting thoughts then, having uh, talked a lot about various things. Uh, choose the right version, first of all. This is usually going to be the classic version. Remember that the Cloud Sync version, although it might represent the future, at the moment is quite limited in what it can do, except for that one uh, special case of disconnected directories, a disconnected forest, I suppose I should say. Um, then, in addition to all the usual prereqs, do think about domain names, but very importantly, take the trouble to clean up your data uh, before uh, installing as you already connect. As well as your overall scenario, and we looked at you know, some of the things you can and can't do with single and multiple uh, forests and so on, think about what should happen to users and groups. In other words, what, sh what should be merged? What are you trying to achieve in terms of the single representation in the target system in, in the cloud? And, and how will that be done? Whatever your chosen authentication method is, consider using PHS anyway. I think I made enough about that. Probably enable the on-premises AD recycle bin. If you're using parser authentication, uh, implement more than one agent for high availability. Also have at least one staging server in addition to your production server for all the reasons we've just discussed and use autom automatic upgrade if you can. Um, one final note is that um, Azure AD Connect uh, has now gone to version two. This is not a big upgrade. It's not something that would result, for example, in, in having to go on another training course or something like that. Um, it's more a matter of bringing it up to date with recent versions of SQL, of servers, and so on. So dropping support for older servers, dropping support for old, older versions of SQL. Um, and there are one or two other requirements that you can see that are in there. It supports larger group sizes by default out of the box. It used to be 50,000. It's now 250,000, which is an Azure thing rather than an Azure ID Connect thing. Um, but it does, uh, at least generally, I think always, require manual upgrade because the changes are, are, are typically, uh, the changes are just too significant for a straightforward uh, up, uh, uh, auto upgrade. But as far as features are concerned, it doesn't look a lot different. So I think that's uh, all I've got to say for now. And I'm going to hand back uh, to Bob. Yeah, Hugh, thank you so much for that. I really learned a lot in that session. I appreciate it. You know, you go through those things, you install it, you learn it, and then, uh, you know, there's always something behind another checkbox that you didn't know about or what have you. And so I think that's probably the single most comprehensive uh, uh, view I've ever had, uh, what you just went through. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure our audience appreciates it as well. It's very a pleasure. Good. So, there were a lot of things that really resonated um, for me uh, in that having having been through the process with Azure AD Connect. Uh, see, you know, it was interesting seeing a lot of customers prior to Azure AD Connect in its current form being out, trying to do you know manage two environments, not understanding that synchronization was the way to go. Um, and I thought I would just wrap this. Uh, put a little uh, end cap or a wrapper on some of the things that Hugh mentioned. Uh, there was one section in particular that really resonated very well for me. It was uh, having staging servers and setting up resilience because you want fault tolerance. You want those things built into the process. And the vast majority of customers I see will have one Azure AD Connect uh, system 
uh, running. And we do hear of problems constantly. And I, I'm gonna mention a couple of those issues that could have been easily taken taken care of with, with uh, a little uh, fore planning. Uh, and it's things like um, staging or, or um, implementing some of the other uh, components that, that Hugh went through. But I wanna go back just for a second to uh, talking about um, you know, the, the other big thing we're finding ourselves uh, all in. Anybody in IT right now uh, is concerned with ransomware attacks, uh, wiper attacks, malicious changes made by insiders, um, you know, somebody compromising a, a, a work account, uh, making lateral movements. And, you know, Active Directory itself was never really designed um, in such a way uh, as to be exposed uh, like we all are now exposing it. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's seen its share of new threats over the past 10, 15, 20 years, never so much as, as now, I believe. And so you see these with all the cyber attacks, there have been five or six uh, you know, this year alone that have been massive, massive breaches, starting with the on-premise directory. And so, you know, we start to look at, you know, Azure uh, AD Connect as being one of those tools to help us move uh, to the cloud. Password hash synchronization is something that everybody that we talk to in the security space is doing because that gives you usable accounts in the cloud if they're, if they're compromised on premise, as long as you can ensure that the compromise wasn't carried through to the cloud. Uh, but I want to just talk briefly about, um, you know, this change. Uh, it used to be when you were, you know, just running Active Directory on-premise and Exchange and SharePoint and all those good platforms Microsoft had, you were responsible for your own kingdom, so to speak, right? Uh, and the keys to those kingdom obviously were Active Directory. Now you're no longer responsible for the hardware as you move to cloud, right? That they're taking care of that. And now you're responsible for making sure the service is configured and that those services are continuously running properly and are available. And say, you know, you still have all the on-premise stuff as well. And so you want to make sure that if something does happen to your environment, you can bounce back from that. We call that resilience. And if you're uh, under attack, it's a you know ransomware wiper attack. You want to make sure that that you can react and and come back from that. And so you know there are a couple things that we just wanted to mention. And this is what Chaosoft does, by the way. This is not necessarily a pitch for us. It's some of the things you need to think about. Uh, for us, it starts with securing your management, right? So you need to make sure that you're following best practices for managing your directories and your systems. Um, you know, implementing roles is a big thing. On-premise, it's Active Directory groups for the most part and ACLs in, in Azure AD, it's roles. Make sure that those are well implemented and planned. Um, you wanna prevent people from making unwanted changes because that's when you start to have issues. Um, and secure administration will help you do that, right? So you get to a point where you, you have deep control over the Microsoft services or the Microsoft stack, we call it, that could be on-premise or cloud, uh, but you wanna make sure that you are able to uh, keep, you know, set and keep control uh, over your Microsoft platforms. And that sometimes is easier said than done when one single setting could blow the whole thing up for you. You also wanna really work to protect your sensitive account uh, accounts and remediate any kind of ongoing issues. Um, the second thing is you wanna really keep an eye on what's going on, both on-premise and cloud. And because we're synchronizing Active Directory identities, the things that are the keys to the kingdom to the cloud, including passwords if you're using password hash, uh, or, or the other direction if you're using password write back. A compromise on-premise can lead to a compromise in the cloud. So you would definitely need to, to, to unify your strategy on monitoring everything on-premise and in the cloud. I suggest that you look at change monitoring and auditing slightly differently. Uh, I suggest or, or would, would uh, argue that change monitoring is more of a real-time thing, change auditing is more of a log review. Uh, so keep an eye on, on both sides of the equation, watch for those inappropriate changes. You're gonna wanna look for misconfigurations as well. There are hundreds of touch points within uh, on-premise Active Directory where the defaults might not meet your needs. 
So get a hardening guide, use that. Uh, start setting up monitoring for um, admin SD holder or, or you know, uh, domain admins or, or enterprise admins. And in the cloud, start monitoring global admins. Keep an eye on those, watch for changes. Uh, and it goes, it goes well beyond that, right? Conditional access policies. If they're changed, you need to know that because it could be somebody in there meddling around. Uh, if your if your unified log in in Office 365 gets disabled, you need to watch that, right? That's a so there's a lot of real estate we now have now that we've connected everything with on-premise uh, uh, Azure AD Connect uh, and then up to to Azure uh, Active Directory. A lot to watch, so so keep an eye on those things and really pay attention. And then finally, you know, something Hugh said, which was really a, a really wise thing was you can set up a staging server and that will serve as a backup. That's absolutely the case. And we do see uh, environments using it uh, for that. Um, Azure Active Directory and Active Directory Recycle Bins, another fantastic, um, uh, fantastic idea. You have to enable it on premise. In the cloud, it's there for you. Uh, users and groups are the primary thing being synchronized. So you're going to have undo, delete uh, for those items, but but be careful there. Uh, test it, understand it, realize that object attribute data is not backed up or restored uh, with recycle bins. Um, so you have to to be a little careful there. Um, On-premise recovery now may include synchronization, right? So if, if something gets deleted and replicated to the cloud, there may be an issue. You may have uh, a challenge getting getting that fully restored properly. There is some metadata that can be lost uh, on the cloud side, so just be careful there. Uh, and then finally, I don't, you know, other than what we do, I'm not sure there's another um, way of doing this really easily. Um, I would also recommend that you keep an eye, as I mentioned earlier, on configuration of these services, right? So I mentioned conditional access policies. That's sort of one thing you want to keep an eye on. Um, uh, you know, different uh, changes to direct permission sets in on-premise Active Directory. You need to monitor that because you never know if somebody's compromised low-level account. Now they're trying to move laterally. Um, or you may have had something very simple happen. Let me give you an example. We had a, a customer, we have a customer, uh, that had, uh, before they purchased our product, they were actually testing it. They had misconfigured a script which removed the members of a group. And it didn't manifest itself as a loss of access in the traditional sense, that group was used for group-based licensing in Office 365. 4,400 first responders lost their email, their teams, their instant messaging on a Friday afternoon, uh, maybe it was Saturday morning, I think. Fortunately, they were using one of our solutions. We identified the issue through the change monitoring we provided, and then we recovered that group membership. And so Within about five minutes of, of uh, us getting the call, we were on a web uh, um, meeting with them. We identified uh, the change by a complainant. One of the users had called the help desk. Uh, we realized that was a change in the group membership. We realized that was a group membership used for group-based licensing. We clicked undo and it, it put all the membership back. Who prints out or records their members of groups, right? You hopefully didn't, didn't have have uh, uh, too large of an impact there, but it's it's service misuse or or changes that you didn't expect that are often the culprit may not be nefarious and might just be that issue. Thanks for letting me diatribe on that a little bit, Hugh. Appreciate it. So, what do you think, Hugh? Well, where are we going? Uh, Azure AD Connect. What are we going to see next? Anything exciting? Well, we, you know, or think? I lose. I alluded okay. to um, <laughs> Cloud Sync looking like the future. So Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync is this uh, cloud-based version of Azure AD Connect. It looks very nice. It's very easy to implement, um, but it doesn't do everything yet. One can imagine that being expanded and uh, taking over more and more of the uh, capabilities. So that's, I think that's one uh, fairly obvious 
um, future thing in Azure AD Connect itself. Um, I think beyond that, there are two other problems that uh, I'm sure Microsoft are going to find ways of, of solving. Uh, one is just being able to write stuff out to all of the on-premises um, legacy systems, which currently might be done by a, pro a product like Microsoft Identity Manager, which you know is is sooner or later going to be be reaching the end of its life. Um, and uh, I think the other one uh, is that more and more HR systems, uh, it's going to be possible to. Uh, bring more and more HR systems into Azure AD Connect because at the moment, and I didn't mention this in, in, in my bit of the talk, it is possible to use Azure AD Connect to pull down um, uh, some from, from some of the cloud HR systems to pull down those authoritative users into AD. But that, um, you know, it is limited to just work day and I think maybe success factors at the moment. Um, obviously, that needs to be expanded to, well, really, ideally, every kind of HR system. So, again, I've got no special knowledge about this. I don't know what they're doing, but that's my guess. Right. From, from what I'm hearing from customers, we have a lot of conversations uh, where people are looking uh, to um ass uh, assess or ascertain if and when there might be an opportunity to uh move completely uh from on-premise active directory and azure ad as a hybrid to cloud only the really large enterprises we talk to most of them are in a situation where they know uh because of as something you mentioned, the applications that are out there are still being fed or still integrated with the on-premise directory. And again, because you don't really do that with Azure AD, uh, you know, you have to wait for those vendors to rewrite them or find replacements. And so that that's quite a bit. And we hear consistently, hey, you know, it, you know, what's what's your plans? Are you are you really working towards having uh, the ability to do cloud only? Well, the answer for us is easy. We already do it, right? You just turn off the legacy stuff and we continue to run cloud only uh, with all our tools. That makes us true hybrid rather than you know, specific application for one uh, platform or the other. So for us, it's a very easy answer. We have that discussion all the time, but I have yet to see any of our really large enterprise or, or even some of the larger mid-sized customers uh, really setting forth plans to make that complete transition. But I think that's where that's headed. And especially when you look at something like Azure Stack, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, the version of Azure uh, provided by Microsoft that uh, you can uh, purchase with some relatively large hardware requirements behind it, but you can put it in your own data center and then operate the Azure fabric. Uh, primarily, I think their first step is get VM uh, management localized uh, on-premise and then they'll work from there. And the cool part is it does open up the Azure market. Um, I think Google and AWS are probably working on something similar but it does not yet come with Azure Active Directory. So we're kind of looking at that as maybe being one of the key steps. Potentially, probably, we, I don't, like you said, Hugh, I don't know what Microsoft plans are. You know, I'm not privy to anything out of the ordinary, but it sure would make sense that that's the way they're going. So. Sure. Yeah, I'd agree with, I'd agree with all of that. Excellent. So uh, I just would like to, Mentioned that Ox Computer Group is uh, a group of related co uh, companies. Um, most of them are called Ox Computer Group, not surprisingly. There are, uh, there's also Third Space in the UK and Trusted ID in the Netherlands. Uh, Ox Computer Training, where I actually spend quite a lot of my time um, writing uh, new training courses, new training material. Uh, we have a whole series of videos on, videos on Azure AD Connect, um, and you can find us uh, at that website. We focus on Microsoft and related technologies, and we basically do everything identity and security related. Excellent, and, excellent. And Bob? Yeah, and just just one thing, um, everybody that I know has worked with you good folks always has glowing things to say. So if, if that's any kind of endorsement, uh, I, I can't do a, a online endorsement for you because I don't have <laughs> I don't know where to go to do that, but I certainly have uh, your reputation has certainly preceded you. Uh, okay, so so a little bit about us. Um, 
if you if you're not familiar with Chaos Soft, we do provide um, uh, management solution, uh, change monitoring, auditing, and then uh, recovery. And those three pieces are, are manage, monitor, recover, pretty simple. It is true hybrid. And that means we do it for both on-premise Active Directory and we do it for Azure Active Directory. And then we do it for the service related components and security related components for both as well. Um, and uh, you know, if you're, if you're looking at uh, on-premise um, recovery, we're definitely in that business. Uh, for Azure Active Directory as well. Uh, it is one utility or one solution that does both. But in particular, we're concentrating on object recovery, including you know the, the group memberships or the attribute data that's changed, uh, domain controller recovery and forest recovery. Uh, we concentrate just like you do, Hugh, on Microsoft. We don't, we're not off doing every other type of of platform vendor out there, but we have this single unified approach uh, where we believe, uh, you know, that journey from on-premise to cloud uh, requires you to have a single interface, a single approach. Um, and that means that our tool supports both a client server model and a new web services model. We have a 99, it's actually 99%, I'm not sure where we have 98 in there. Maybe they didn't mm -hmm. think you believe 99, but 99% uh, customer retention. That's a three to five year average, not just this year. I think we're known for our innovative solutions. Um, people love our support. We know we don't start with, did you reboot your computer? We start with a little bit higher um, level engineer. And I think what we do probably better than anything is listen to our customers and introduce their feedback. We love it. Super. So at this point, I'm going to turn All it back right. over to McKenna. Thanks, Bob. And thanks to you guys. Great presentation. Very, very thorough. I'm sure our listeners are going to love hearing about this. So thank you guys so much. Uh, for everyone still listening, that concludes our presentation today. We'd like to thank everyone for their time and hope you enjoyed the webinar. We'll now take attendance and draw for those two Amazon gift cards we talked about earlier. If you've won, uh, we'll reach out to you directly for your contact information. If you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us here at KOSoft or Oxford Computer Group. Um, we've included the websites here on the screen for you if you want to get more information about either of those two companies. And thank you guys so much again for your time. Uh, that concludes our presentation.